The woods have long been considered a place for the witch to retreat to, perhaps to meet with her coven, or in solitary upon dawn to collect herbs still covered in dew. The canopy of the trees offer not only the witch shelter and protection, but also the animals, genius loci, tree gods and fairy folk. Let's take a venture into the woods together now. On the cusp of spring, we might be so lucky as to see bluebells upon the ground, only ever present in more ancient woodlands. Perhaps we will see a rabbit streak ahead of us and tentatively stop to gaze and sniff a patch of primroses. Perhaps these are a doorway to the other world. Take a deep breath in. As you do, the woody, mossy scent of the forest floor hits you. Perhaps the light dapples through the trees above you. Take a moment to appreciate the presence of the trees around you. All connected to one another, these trees stood strong across centuries of time. You may wish to take your shoes off now you are here. This allows you to connect with the forest floor and ground yourself. Perhaps walk towards a tree that specifically calls to you and sit with your back nestled into it. Feel its energy perhaps through your back or even with your hands against the ripples and nobbles of its trunk. This could be the perfect place to sit quietly and meditate in a bid to connect with the magical creatures and energies of the woods. Whilst you are here, you may wish to forage for herbs, mushrooms, but the forest witch knows they mustn't ingest the wrong thing so ensures they know what is edible and what isn't. Perhaps you will find pine needles that you can shape into smoke cleansing bundles, maybe pine cones, acorns and seed pods that can adorn your altar, bringing in energies of success and abundance. You may find branches that have dropped from a tree to the woods floor that you might use for a wand, staff, or if big enough to help make a besom. Collect a little forest soil that you can add to spells for grounding and fairy magic. Animals you spot within the woods can also offer up spiritual meaning. The deer is connected to wild energies, moon goddesses, innocence and purity, instinct and regeneration. The fox represents tricks the gods, trickery, cunning, wild magic and witchcraft. And if you live somewhere where there are bears, the bear represents strength and endurance and was a Celtic symbol of the mother goddess. You may discover bones or antlers within the woods that you can ethically collect. Before you take them, ask the animals permission. Never disturb them if they appear to form part of an animal's home. You may wish to use them within your magic to empower your magic, to work with the spirit of the animal they belong to, or to decorate your altar. You may find feathers on your travels in the woods that you might do the same with. Much overlaps with the hedge witch, green witch, forest witch, even the fairy witch. The forest witch tends to have much interest in folk magic, local legends, animism and genius loci. They perhaps prefer rituals carried out in the solitude of the forest or using its energy and often have a love of wild magic and wild crafting. The genius loci are the spirits of the land where we live. These can be the spirits of the trees, stones, flowers, soil, bushes and wildlife. 
all the natural elements we come across outside our front door. You may want to create your own separate grimoire that relates to your flora and fauna findings whilst out in the wild. This can be somewhere you document your findings, perhaps write on your observations, stick photos in of places that you've been to, document different trees, plants, mushrooms, animals and so on that you have encountered along with their medicinal and magical properties. Any folklore or local legends relating to what you have found, rituals, meditation or journeying that you've experienced whilst there and noting the changes you find across the season. By connecting with your local lands, you are forging a connection that can help you harness nature's energy within your craft. You may wish to update or start an altar to reflect your connection to the land. You could decorate with plants, vegetation, leaves, foliage, berries, nuts, seeds, acorns, roots, pieces of naturally shed wood or bark, feathers, sticks, bones, soil from the woods, water from streams that may run through the woods, mushrooms, statues or images, so depictions of perhaps the green man or wood-related deities such as Artemis, Diana, Kenanus. Connecting with the land in such a way is said to also help you to connect with the Fae. Many who have had fairy sightings are often very connected to nature or have had an encounter as a result of attempting to harm it. The Green Man is an ancient archetype with a version found in almost every forest across the world. A forest spirit who dates back hundreds, if not thousands of years, steeped in folklore. The guardian of the forest, he is an ever-present symbol of rebirth, regeneration and the life and death cycle of nature. As king of the forest, he is ultimately tasked with keeping the woods wild, preserving the forest's sanctity, plants, trees, rivers and animals. A forest god to our ancient ancestors, he is often depicted as a man with green skin covered in foliage of all different kinds, ranging from oak leaves, acorns, hawthorn leaves, and sometimes holly leaves and berries. At times, the leaves are shown spewing from his mouth. Some believe he is linked to the oak and holly king, as he is sometimes depicted with oak leaves and acorns, or holly leaves and berries, and considered a seasonal entity of them. I personally see him as a separate being entirely. His power cycle is said to be from spring equinox through to Beltane. This is when his power peaks. He returns each spring with new growth, of course, playing to the themes of rebirth, renewal, regeneration and resurrection. He has association with deities such as Cairninus, Celtic god, who I see him most connected to. Horned god of the Celts, lord of the forest, tasked with the same duties to be the guardian of the woods and its creatures, and he has a primal wildness about him. Some depictions of the green man show him with horns also. Other deities that are linked to the green man are Dionysus, the Greek god, Pan, Greek god, Bacchus, Roman god, Faunus, Roman god, Green George, Celtic origin, Green Jack, also Celtic origin, the Garland King, Celtic origin, and that's just European deities, let alone any others across the globe. Jack in the Green is an ancient Irish figure central to Beltane, the Fire and Fertility Festival. He will be covered in foliage and paraded in a procession for the Beltane Parade to ensure a bountiful crop. This tradition all but died out, yet the recent pagan resurgence has seen it happen again. In Scotland, a similar figure is present called the Berryman, who is covered in sticky burdock heads that are called berries. 
He makes his way in and around the town to ensure good luck for the year ahead. The Garland King makes an appearance in Derbyshire. Here he is all dressed in flowers. The Green Man also mirrors the forest spirits called the Fawns, mythological wood creatures that have goat-like features, goat legs, cloven hooves and a tail and lived in the forest. They were both feared and revered, and instead of covered in leaves like the green man, they were covered in hair. The fawn also links to the wild men of the woods, also known as wood woes, wad wad woes, or wood wasps. These men are shrouded in mystery, much like the green man. These men were covered in hair and said to live in the woods. They possessed a otherworldly wisdom. The pagan gods were demonised by the church and ultimately fell to folklore after their cults felt the pressure to convert to Christianity. Of course, throughout the Dark Ages and much of history, one is warned from venturing into the woods, lest they should encounter beasts, fairies and wild men. Wild men and fairies sound wonderful to me. Where do I sign up? (laughs) In the British Isles, the forests a thousand years ago were vast, spreading for miles and miles, farther than the eye could see. Because of the sheer size, the forest could be a dark and scary place. However, it was also a place you had to enter, whether you wanted to or not, because it provided meat for hunting, plants for eating, and wood for burning and building. In the winter, the forest must have seemed quite dead and desolate, but in the spring, it returned to life. It would be logical for early peoples to have applied some sort of spiritual aspect to the cycle of life, death and rebirth. Robin Hood, also called Robin of the Merry Greenwood, has been linked to the Green Man. Citing the website Left Lion, Robin was not so much the vigilante hero he is thought of today, being more reminiscent of capricious pagan fairies and goblins. Popular until the reign of Elizabeth I, festival goers would often dress as this embodiment of misrule and mirth, with men riotously tearing about town. One case from 1492, cited by the folklorist J.C. Holt, sees a group of young men dressed as Robin and his entourage, defending their drunken behaviour by claiming that acting in such a manner was a long-standing tradition, turning an intoxicated spree into the preservation of cultural heritage. Let us note that Robin is known to wear green and is of the forest and the legend of the green man is ubiquitous to the same area of England from which Robin Hood emerges. The story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is also said to be linked to the green man. Overall all these figures and the green man symbolize the untouched parts of the forest that refuse to be tamed. They all represent virility, fertility, and a love for the primal world. Author Luke Mastin says that the first use of the term green man seems to have been just before World War II. He writes, the label green man, perhaps surprisingly, dates back only to 1939, when it was used by Lady Raglan, wife of the scholar and soldier Major Fitzroy Somerset, 4th Baron Raglan, in her article, The Green Man in Church Architecture, published in The Folklorist. The Green Man can be found adorning many ancient churches. There are several arguments as to why they are depicted. One being that for a time, pagans and Christians were able to exist side by side quite happily. The Christians carved the image of the green man onto the walls of their churches to honour their God and almost attract the pagans to join them. In later years, when relations between the two were less harmonious, the image was seen as denoting the segregation between the two, that the old gods were like stone and had been conquered by the church. 
Others believe it was through the stonemasons who built the churches, still holding on to their pagan ways. And one last argument is the church felt they needed to appease the old gods or devils by giving them a small honorary image or place of their own upon the church. I also read that some churches started to require pagans to use separate entrances to churches, almost like the tradesman's entrance. Often this would be a side or hidden entrance of the church that was identified by the green man face above its door. It was during this time that the green man face also began to take on demonic connotations. Exeter Cathedral was built in the 12th century. A Norman Gothic building, it has around 20 depictions of the horned god. I would dare to say being in the West Country, they had a lot of pagans to try to attract or a lot of appeasing to be done with the old gods. Scottish cemeteries also used the green man motif, a symbol of creation and life springing out of death. There are dozens of churches overall throughout the UK that have the green man adorning the building somewhere, not to mention British pubs and inns called the green man. Even my parents used to go drinking in a pub in Downham, South London, called the green man when they first met. There are around 30 pubs in London alone that go by the name the green man. Some say this name may have been given as in the building there was an apothecary that gathered herbs centuries ago. An old English term for the countryside is Greenlands. Celtic tradition revolved around the fertility of the land and lush vegetation was a sign of prosperity. Another name the green man is given are Lord of the Greenwood and the dying resurrection god of vegetation. William Anderson writes in his book, The Green Man, he is also the guardian and revealer of mysteries, the intelligence of the world of vegetation who knows and utters the secret laws of nature and the life force that sustains us, but is beyond our power to control. He represents new growth and decay, reminds us that we are part of nature's cycles, not distant from them. Coming back to our trip through the woods, one of my favourite flowers that often pops up wildly there is the primrose. I've planted primroses outside my front and back door as I love them so much. The name primrose in Latin is prima rosa, meaning first rose. However, it is no relation to the rose. The primrose has many links to the fairy world and witchcraft. Firstly, the flower is seen as being a conduit to the fairy world. The primrose is often found in the shade of the hedgerows, in the woods, along streams and under bushes. They are often considered the first sign of spring and can flower from early January through to mid-May. The Irish have a long tradition with primrose flowers. It's said that those visiting the other world or Tiananug brought back primrose as evidence that they had actually been there. It was also believed that the keys to Tiananug were primrose or cowslip. Druids were known to carry primrose flowers during some of their rituals to protect them from evil. The Celts believed that a batch of primrose growing wild could be a gateway to the realm of fairy. A posy made of primrose touched to the surface of a rock could open the portal. If you wished to ask the blessing of the fairies for your home and those in it, you placed primrose flowers on the doorstep. Hanging primrose outside the house was considered an invitation for fairies to enter. It was also believed that eating primrose allowed you to see fairies. The Sabbath most associated with the Fae is Beltane. Being the flower of love and quite often associated with wantonness along with Beltane itself. It's also considered a good luck token. 
Primroses, along with yellow gorse shrubs, were often laid across the threshold to welcome the arrival of the first day of spring. In earlier times, fairies were quite often creatures to be feared, and as they were most often active around Beltane, special precautions were taken. Primrose flowers were often used to ward off denizens of the realm of fairy, rather than trying to attract them. In the National Folklore Collection in University College Dublin, there's a section of verse from County Kerry in Ireland relating to Beltane and fairies. Guard the house with a string of primroses on the first three days of May. The fairies are said not to be able to pass over or under this string. As butter making season began in May in Ireland, to encourage milk production, farmers would rub primrose on the udders of cows on Beltane. In contrast to the practice of laying primrose on your doorstep to ask the blessing of fairies, it was also thought to keep them from stealing the butter. Another animal association with primrose flowers is that of chickens. It was thought to cause bad luck to bring primroses into the house in early spring when chickens are first laying eggs. Fewer primroses in the spring were also thought to be a harbinger of fewer eggs. Healing properties were thought to abound in primrose, flowers being used both fresh or dried and the root as well which was used as a dried herb. In the Middle Ages, it was used for gout, rheumatism, paralysis, and an infusion of the root was used for toothaches. The latter a belief which carried on in Ireland by rubbing the tooth with the flower for two minutes. The 17th century British botanist Nicholas Culpepper wrote, Of the leaves of primrose is made as fine a salve to heal wounds as any I know. A remedy collected in Dorset said that the gypsies used primrose as a cure of skin problems and said to boil three primrose leaves in a pint of water and then drink the water. Similarly, a concoction of primrose and pig lard was used to create a salve for burns. It was also used to cure jaundice and mixed with cowslip, an ointment for wrinkles and facial spots. Tea made from primrose was a treatment for insomnia in County Cork in Ireland. Dried primrose roots strained through milk was used to treat the cough of horses by inhaling and one would think for people as well. In Shakespeare's time there was a form of anemia which often proved fatal and seemed to afflict young maidens especially known as the green sickness, as it gave the victim a yellow-green complexion or maid's malady. It was thought that after death, the lady would turn into primroses. If a woman died unmarried, a garland was made with primroses and other spring flowers as a sign of her purity, cut down in the springtime of life. It was forbidden to pluck flowers from the garland and instead they were left to drop apart naturally and then buried in the churchyard. It was also customary to cover the bed of newlyweds with flowers, primrose in particular. When a person died unmarried, the same custom applied to the corpse where the grave was referred to as the nuptial bed. If we are lucky in the woods, we will also find the bluebell. The bluebell has many names from English bluebell to wild hyacinth, woodbell, bell bottle, cuckoo's boots, wood hyacinth, ladies' nightcap to witches' thimbles. Bluebells are associated with the fae in many ways. The ringing of bluebells' bells are said to call the fae to their gatherings. Different superstitions are held around humans hearing the bells, such as to hear bluebells' bells means an evil fairy will visit you and death will follow. That humans can ring the bluebells' bells and the fae will be called to their service and that placing bluebells under your pillow or hanging them near your bed will ward off nightmares. 
Bluebell Woods are said to be fairy enchanted and the fairies use these flowers to lure people in and take them away to the other world. Parents may have created the superstition that small children who pick a bluebell flower will disappear, never to be seen again, which could have been a great way to prevent little ones from picking these delicate, beautiful wildflowers. Other beliefs are that should you pick the bluebells and bring them home, you will bring bad luck upon yourself as the fae will punish you for stealing or damaging their flowers. Harebells are the name given to bluebells in certain parts of Scotland, as many believed witches could shapeshift into hares and hide amongst them. Bluebells are associated with ancient woodland and are native to Western Europe with the UK being the flowers species stronghold. Half the world's bluebells exist in England alone, with thousands of bluebell bulbs existing in one woodland, creating a blue carpet signifying spring is here. Bluebells can also be found in hedgerows and fields. Bluebell colonies take five to seven years to establish from seed to flower. In the language of flowers, bluebells are said to mean gratitude, constancy, humility, kindness and everlasting love. All parts of the bluebell are toxic, therefore no means to use it within our witchery. Historically, bluebell bulbs were crushed and the sap was used to create adhesive, which was used to bind books. The sap repelled insects that were known to damage books through their feasting on the materials used. Bluebell sap was used as far back as the Bronze Age, when it was used to fix arrow flights to arrows. In the Elizabethan times, it was used as a starch to stiffen their roughed collars and sleeves. Medicinally, as all parts of the bluebell are toxic, there is little reference to it within folk magic. It was used to cure snake bite, however not recommended, as the poison within the bluebell would have been as dangerous as that of the snake bite. Bluebell bulbs have diuretic to increase urination and styptic properties that help to stop bleeding. Research is ongoing as to how bluebell flowers could potentially help to fight cancer. That is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed our trip to the woods. If you would like to access grimoire pages or any other additional witchy content, there is a link in the show notes where you could sign up to my Patreon for just £6 per month. Sending you lots and lots of witchy love. <laughs>